Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Open Source Developers at Google Speaker Series. This evening, we are privileged to have with us Michael Still, who is a Myth TV developer, in addition to his responsibilities at Google as a site reliability engineer. And tonight, Michael will be presenting on Practical Myth TV. Michael, take it away. Thank you. So my microphone works, right? Uh, cool. Yeah. All righty. Um, OK, so I thought I'd just quickly start off by saying who I am and what I do here. So I'm here because I happen to write a book on Myth TV. Turns out there's a couple of other books on the subject, so, you know, kind of whatever. And I'm a site reliability engineer here at Google, which means I'm some sort of combination of a software engineer and a Linux system admin. I happen to work on uh, the clusters that, you know, run Google's publicly visible pro products. You know, not really all that relevant. So I thought tonight what we'd do is I'll introduce Myth TV brief briefly. I'll talk about some of the stuff it does in the currently released version. Then I'll talk about uh, you know, how you set up, set up some of it and you know, how you get going, that kind of thing. And then I wanted to finish off by talking about some of the features that are coming up in the next release, because there's some reasonably cool stuff there. So let's get started. So Myth TV is an open source PVR package, which means it's a lot like, say, a TiVo, or you know, there's a bunch of open source PVRs, it turns out, Sage, and a couple of others. And what that means is it will record TV off of the air and you can play it back later whenever you want. It's got all the standard PVR features like rewind, fast forward, pausing live TV, that kind of stuff. It's got a couple of unique features that you wouldn't see in, say, a TiVo, like it can automatically skip commercials. It's got, got a web interface that let, lets you stream videos wherever, that kind of thing. So that's pretty cool. Ah, okay, so the question, question is, is there a rationale for the name Myth TV? And what I should probably say is the other, the other thing is feel free to interrupt and ask questions because otherwise this will get really boring. It's a reference to the mythical convergence PC. So I think it was, you know, back in the 90s people were talking about how, you know, your lounge room would, or living room or whatever would become one machine and that machine would do everything. This was considered a bit of a myth. Myth TV is that machine. It, you know, plays videos, it plays DVDs, it will, you know, deal with, you know, streaming audio and pre-recorded audio. It does all of that kind of stuff. In fact, one of the things I'll talk about later is the next release will integrate with home security systems and you can have you know, closed circuit video cameras around your house and have those pop up as a picture in picture display, that kind of thing. So it, it's a reference to this mythical convergence PC that people were talking about a while ago. So I think I've mentioned that you, know, you can record and playback TV, you, know, you can do audio and DVDs and that kind of thing as well. Another cool thing about Myth TV is it has a really strong plug-in system. So in the user interface, it's not always obvious which bits are built in and which bits are plugins. And it's actually relatively easy to write new plugins. So for example, uh, there's a weather plugin that will tell you, you know, based on weather.com data, what the weather is like at the moment. That's just a plugin. So if you don't like how it works or if you think of something that you want to do with Myth, it's reasonably easy to write new ones. So I thought what I'd do is I'd start off by uh, having a poke around in Myth and seeing uh, and showing you what it looks like. Catch, of course, is I have like six machines here. So hopefully this will just work. Unless the screen's off. Okay, so Myth TV has two major components. There's a back end and a front end. So if we just start at the back end, uh, I'll explain a little bit more what the back end and the front end are in a minute. We'll ignore the message saying, have you really read the installation instructions? <laughs> And then there's the front end. Now the other thing I should say is what I'm demonstrating here is the latest development release. In fact, the latest from two days ago. So if it crashes, that's not actually an indication of the stability of the real release of Myth TV at the moment. This is still a tiny bit flaky, but it's got some cool stuff I want to show you. So Myth TV has a theme system. So this just happens to be the theme I run at home. You can pick whatever you want. And in fact, it's also reasonably easy to define your own themes if none of them take your fancy. Media library is where you go to watch pre-recorded video. So recordings are things that came off of live TV, so you know, your Comcast cable or your Dish TV or you know, free-to-air TV or whatever. Videos are video files that came from somewhere else. For instance, you know, videos of your kids running around the park that came off a handy cam or you know, ripped DVDs, that kind of thing. An image gallery is kind of what it sounds like. Play games is interesting. You can run classic arcade games on Myth because it integrates with MAME. And this is the screen that shows you all the recordings you have. 
So what I want to do is I'm just going to play a random recording. So this is actually a, a news report, which is why it's in black and white, because it's talking about some stuff that came out of the Australian archives recently. You can skip ahead and back. Now, the video here is blocky because this is a downloaded video in AVI format, and it's waiting for a keyframe before it will correct. And the user interface is blocky because it's matched the resolution of the video. What else do I want to show you here? Ah, that's the other thing I wanted to show you that I kind of missed there. Let's play a different video for a second. So one of the things you can do is if you're playing and you skip along and you have to walk away for some reason, then Myth will optionally ask you whether or not you want to save where you're up to. So if I select that, when I come back and watch that show, it will start up from that point again. OK, so let's talk a little bit about Myth itself. Nope, I've got to switch back. So as I mentioned before, Myth TV has two major components. There's a back end and a front end. The back end is responsible for capture stuff. So it's the thing that's controlling the tuner cards and making sure that all your shows get recorded. It's also the part that talks to a SQL database that records what recordings you want at what time, you know, your, your preferences. You can say, for instance, that The Simpsons is more important than you know, the family guy and only get the Sim family guy if you know, you've got an idle tuner, that kind of thing. And then you have front ends. And front ends are the way that video gets displayed around the house. So it means, for instance, that you can have more than one back end. If, you know, heaven forbid you had so many tuners, they didn't all fit in one machine. Or, you know, there's physical constraints, like, you know, you've got your dish TV in one place, and then you've got your, I don't know, Comcast in a different place. You can run two machines in different spots with different capture cards. And, the front, and multiple front ends means you can be playing back more than one video at once. So for instance, at home, I have four or five front ends. There's the one in the living room, the kids have one in their bedrooms, you know, the laptops have them, that kind of thing. So it's trivial to be watching something in the living room and watching something completely different on a laptop somewhere else in the house. So the data is stored in two places. There's a MySQL database for all the metadata, like program guides and what's been recorded previously and your preferences and that kind of thing. And then there's just a bunch of disk where you store recordings. Uh, that also includes things like the videos you've downloaded and you know, MP3 files and that kind of thing. Now, the, the just a bunch of disk, there are a couple of caveats. I use ext3. ext3 is not particularly efficient at deleting large files. So every time I delete a recording, there's a couple of second pause. There is an option you can turn on that says, hey, delete these things in the background, but you'll still experience a slight pause. Uh, the co-author for, for the book, Stuart, uses XFS, which is extents-based, which means it's much faster at deleting large files. EXT4 will improve in this regard, too. Uh, but then again, you know, Stuart's a little bit biased because he worked on the team that wrote XFS. So I also said you can play back DVDs with Myth. Now, it used to be that what you'd use is an external player, and that still works. Excuse me one second. Now, the external players are just command lines that get run when you say, hey, please play a DVD. So people in the past would use Zine and mPlayer and that kind of thing. Now, it's still possible to do that if you have some special requirement, like you know, DVDs in a weird format that Myth can't support or whatever. But these days, you're probably generally best off just using uh, the internal player. The internal player is based off mPlayer, and it's much nicer than it used to be. Even one release ago, it wasn't particularly reliable. Does it support DVD menus? Yes. Yes, we'll get to that in a second. Um, it's much nicer than it used to be. In the previous release, for instance, DVDs men menus didn't work. Now they just do. Um, and the advantage of using the internal player is all the remote control stuff maps properly. So one of the problems was that you know, mPlayer didn't support menus back, back then. I think it might now. Um, Zine had different keyboard layouts, so all the key controls would change if you were playing a DVD. If you use the internal player, then everything is consistent and it just works. And I think I've kind of said all of that. Oh, yeah, and encrypted DVDs work, although you have to install uh, libdcss, which, depending on your distribution, may or may not be shipped. You might need to you know, download it separately and install it. So I thought I'd show you that working as well. One thing I forgot to show you earlier, actually. So Information Center is where the plugins hide. So for instance, this is a Movie Times plugin isn't going to immediately work. That's a shame. 
Oh, okay, it's talking on the network and this machine's not networked at the moment. <coughs> ah, yes, because it's not on the network. Oh, yeah, it crashed. Let's pretend that didn't happen. Uh, what, what, when you said the internal player is good enough, are you talking about the current stable version? Or the yes, the current stable version of the internal player is good enough. I've been using it at home for probably a year now and it just works. So this is the internal DVD player, which will work when I ask it nicely. Oh, it's going to be one of those days. This all worked, of course, this morning. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. I think that makes it happy. Um, <laughs> So the question was, why are there two slashes? But I think the problem is actually that the dock on the laptop is unhappy. I think the machine didn't detect that it was docked when, because I'm demoing on a laptop, not a real computer. Okay, we'll go back to that demo, and what I might do is, when I'm talking on the next slide, I'll, um, I'll quickly reboot the machine and prove to you that that works. <coughs> so, nobody look. Uh, Just bear with me for a second. Okay, so we'll leave that starting up and we'll Go talk about something else for a bit. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about is commercial detection. So Myth TV can uh, automatically detect commercials and it, and it will skip them if you want it to. That's configurable. So what happens is, again, configurably, once a recording has finished or once a significant chunk of a recording has happened, there's this commercial detection program that runs on the video file. And what it does is it goes through and it finds all the starts of the com commercials and the ends and it will map those. And then when you're playing back, when it reaches one of those, it will just skip to the marker that says, here's the end of the commercial. The commercial detection's actually very reliable, much more reliable than I thought it was. The only problem I've really experienced is if you've got a show that's very dark, for instance, you know, Law and Order has lots of those black scenes that say, hey, we've changed to the county court or whatever, it tends to have problems with that kind of stuff. But then again, it's really easy in the menu system to say, hey, for this recording, don't use commercial detection. And it's also really easy um, to disable it for a show forever. You can say, hey, never with law and order use commercial detection. <coughs> now, the other thing you can do is you can convert those detected commercials to a cut list. Cut lists are how you edit videos in Myth TV. So, for instance, you can say, now that you've detected commercials and I trust you that you're going to get it right, remove them forever and save me some disk space, which is kind of cool. You can also use cut lists to do stuff like if you're recording you know, a sports game and you don't really know when it's going to end, once you've recorded it, you can go to the end of the actual game and say, hey, throw away everything after this. And Myth uses a lossless transcode system for that. So it's a little bit complicated. What happens with most video formats is every now and then there's a keyframe. It's normally every few seconds. And then in between the keyframes, they just store differences in the image. Now, that makes the files much smaller. What happens when you're transcoding is if you say chop here, let's say we're going to chop this part out here, we've lost a keyframe. So Myth needs to go through and generate a new keyframe. That new keyframe won't be as good as the original one because the compression systems they use throw away data that you can't get back. It's called lossy compression. So for this small portion, you'll find that the image quality isn't as high but it's probably not something you're going to notice on a normal television anyway, because the televisions tend to be fuzzy. And again, it's just going to be for this, you know, this is probably a couple of seconds, so most people don't really care about that kind of stuff. So let's see if my other machine has come back from being kicked in the shin. Is there a simplistic explanation as to what distinguishes commercial video from uh, program material video? Okay, so the algorithm's reasonably complex. They do stuff like uh, they look for the station logos that are at the bottom of... Sorry, I should go back and say. what the, the question was, how does commercial detection work? And 
basically what they do is they uh, look for the station logo at the bottom of the image. They look for black frames, which often appear in between uh, the commercials and the advertising. And I believe they also look for the intensity of the image. Like often, you know, ads will be brighter than, you know, the show or whatever. So there's a bunch of stuff they do to try and detect that. Yeah, I'm not sure if they use volume or not, to be <laughs> honest, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do. I thought there was some kind of signal that was sent out for every commercial. No, I, I'm, I don't believe that the, that the TV stations actually mark commercials, because that's probably not in their best interests. And it's also not consistent globally, right? So, you know, commercial detection works kind of everywhere. I'm going to have one of those days, aren't I? Is there any special magic I have to do to get... Or maybe if I select the right machine, it'll work. Oh, there, well, there we go. Yeah, it's pressing the right button. Like, it's one of those things, right? You do these demos at your desk 14 times during the day, and they all just work. And by definition, when you get in front of people, they will fail in some unexpected manner. Uh, that's why you should never do demos in front of actual people, I think. Uh, yeah, you should only have robots to demo in front of. So let's just start Myth up again. This is running at a lower resolution because the machine detected the wrong resolution when it started up, but that's OK. OK, so I promised that I'd play you a DVD. Let's see if the DVD drive on the machine is happy now. There we go. So one of the cool things about the DVD player is it also doesn't honor the no-fly regions. A lot of discs say, hey, you can't skip this bit. You can in myth. So all of this boring stuff I don't care about, that's all good. So we can start playing a DVD. And the menus just work. So uh, let's turn on subtitles. The subtitles in this are actually quite funny because they are not English. They're in Alien for reasons I can't fully explain. Yeah, so the subtitles are in Crazy Alien. But anyway, so DVD playback really does work. What was I meant to be showing you? No, oh, that's right. Commercial detection. Uh, so if we go back to my victim recording, my notes say that at about six minutes, there's a commercial. Oh. Uh, yeah, not if I'm sorry. I've just had a request from the nice man. Oh, wrong key. Let's just pause for a second. I can never remember where I set screen resolution. Hey, Andrew, where do I set screen resolution? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> right under screen resolution. Oh, my machine doesn't like you anymore. OK, well, we're just going to keep going. So at about six minutes, there's advertising, I believe. Blam, there we go. So it skipped two minutes of video, because if we go back, there was some random ad. So, so far I've talked about, you know, that there's a back end, there's a front end, records video, yeah, yeah, yeah. The next bit I want to talk about is user jobs. Yeah. What would have happened if you had actually changed the resolution? Would the uh, front end be confused about suddenly the resolution or the projection is changing? Mm -hmm. Or would it not be the right thing? Okay, so the question was would the front end be confused by the resolution changing on the fly? The answer is it depends how it's compiled. If it's got XRNR installed, it'll just handle it. Um, so it should have just worked. I think the problem is that the laptop detected what resolution the screen could do when it started up, and the screen for some reason said something horrible. OK, so the next bit I want to talk about is user jobs. So once a recording has finished, Myth has this ability to run arbitrary scripts, and they're called user jobs. 
So for example, one of the things I do is I do a reasonable amount of flying and I tend to watch videos on planes. So this is a Nokia N800, it's just a little handheld tablet thing. And so I have a user job that will transcode my video formats to the correct format for that device. You can also do it for iPods, PlayStation portables, you know, iPhones, whatever. Uh, and all a user job is is just a command line that gets run with arguments passed in. So the arguments are things like the location the video is at on disk, the title of the video, the subtitle, that kind of thing. And that makes some pretty cool things possible. Now most of the examples I'm going to talk about are transcoding, but you can do other things as well. So one of the cool things is NovExport. NovExport is one of the several ways you can convert video formats from what MIFF uses, which is often MPEG, uh, to various formats suitable for other devices. It gets its name because depending on the hardware you use, MIFF will sometimes store the videos in a format called NUPL video, which has .nuv as its extension. So NUV export's reasonably hard to get going. I ended up having to patch the code. So there's also a patch at my site if you decide to go this route. Oh, and you need a new version of FFmpeg for our iPods to work properly. Now, I mentioned that the command lines have these flags you can pass in. So these are probably the four most useful flags, although there are others as well. So NUV export is overkill if all you want to do is stuff like permanently removing the commercials. Myth TV comes with its own transcode application called Myth Transcode that does that cool lossless transcoding thing. And again, it's just a command line that you run. But because these user jobs are just command lines, you can run random things. So if, for instance, you really, really cared about a particular show and you wanted to get an email when a new one had been recorded, you could do that. Or if, for instance, you know, you wanted to copy the video file from where Myth puts it on disk to the right place for it to automatically get synced with your laptop, you can do that kind of stuff as well. You can do basically anything you can do in a shell script. So I guess what I'm trying to say is don't limit yourself to just transcoding. There's some reasonably cool stuff you can do with this. The next release of Myth TV will also let you execute these with a delay. So the example they're using is, let's say you record everything in you know, high definition. Those files tend to be pretty big. And you go away for a while, and your hard disk starts filling up. You can set rules in the next release like, if I haven't watched this video for seven days, then transcode it to a smaller format that doesn't look as good. Which means you still have the show, but you're not using up so much disk. So I mentioned before that you can have more than one front end. Now setting up remote front ends is really easy. What you do is you just install the binaries like you would normally. And in the configuration program, which is normally called Myth TV Setup, although some distributions rename it, um, you just change the database configuration to point to the back end. Now at the moment you can run front ends on Linux and Mac OS. There has been some work to get them working on Windows. That's been going for a couple of years. And they don't have a good finished product yet. But maybe they will sometime soon. It's not clear to me that it really matters because the web interface that ships with the new version means you're probably not going to want to run as many front ends anyway. And I'll show you that in a little bit. And I've also said you can have more than one back end. And that's pretty easy too. When you install the second back end, you just tell it it's a slave in the configuration application and tell it where the master is. And they'll go and negotiate amongst themselves about who's going to record what when. You can also use the extra backends if you end up doing so much transcoding that you need more CPUs, that kind of thing. You can also control your front ends over the network, which initially doesn't sound all that useful, but I found a couple of ways that I think it's cool. So um, it makes a whole bunch of remote things much nicer. So what I'll do is I'll start off by showing you the Telnet interface, which is the default way that you control it over the network. Is that font big enough? Can you see that? Now, the catch with the Telnet interface is that there's no authentication or encryption. You're just in. But you can do a bunch of really interesting things, like uh, key down. You can see that it's moving down the menu. Or key enter, which will start the video playing. Maybe we want to pause it. You know, that kind of thing. 
So this is cool if it's inside your house, but you wouldn't want to let this out on the internet, right? Because random people are going to do bad things to your TV. So I have... Oh, interesting, just a second. This is going to need network. So let's just bring the network up. So I have an instant messaging interface that I use instead. That means I can instant message my TV from work and tell it to do stuff. My wife finds this really annoying because I'll be controlling the front end while she's trying to watch TV. Let me just find my notes so I don't forget to tell you anything. Kind of. So the question is, can you do fuzzy matching stuff like you can on TiVo? And the short answer is, is if you can express it in SQL, then yes. So there's this advanced recording mode where you can say, hey, record any show that matches this SQL expression. So for instance, you could say, you know, record any show that contains the word Google in you know, the description, for instance. But it's, you know, it doesn't do anything like, you know, hey, you like action shows, so I'll start recording this random other one. So it doesn't have anything like that. Oh, I'm going to have one of those days, aren't I? How does it get program information? We're going to talk about guide data a little bit later because it's about to change in the US as well uh, in a way that doesn't have absolutely everybody happy. Oh, actually, we can just do that. Oh, no, that's not what I want. Sorry, because we rebooted the machine, we ended up in this no network state. Anyway, so so this is just a little Python uh, Google Talk bot. It connects to the Google Talk network with an account that I use uh, for controlling my uh, PC at home. So I guess you know you guys can control my PC at home now too. Um, And if we just start up an instant messaging client, and let it connect. And we'll get rid of that because it's boring. I can now do exactly what I could do on the Telnet interface, but over instant messages. So for instance, oh, that's right. It probably wants to know who I am. I can unpause. I can also do other stuff, like I can do on-screen display stuff. That's at a really low resolution because this video is at a low resolution. But so the actual reason I wrote this was so I could tell my wife that I was leaving work now <laughs> and um, not have to ring her all the time. So there we go. So you can also control it with instant messages, which is probably a little bit gratuitous, but I thought it was fun. Yes, there's actually, there's actually a slide somewhere in here. Oh, here we go, the next slide. Yes, so you can get that from my site again. Um, in fact, I'll put the slide deck for this talk up there later. So you may or may not want to write that down, I don't mind. So I've done that. I've kind of already showed you on-screen displays. The Telnet interface doesn't let you do on-screen displays. Uh, there's a separate tool to do that, which I'll quickly show you. And again, it's yet another command line. So let me just flick to the page so I don't fat finger it and make a fool of myself yet again. Now the catch with on-screen displays is you have to be playing a video for them to work. But uh, where was? No, that's not the. No, by definition, it'll be the last one, right? <laughs> I'm just going to open a new one. So Myth TV on-screen display, let's use the alert template. And so you can just display on-screen displays with command line. 
So I know people who do stuff like, you know, detect that their CPU is running hot, and will pop something off on the screen saying, hey, you know, the machine's hot, or you're running out of disk, or, you know, it's a little bit weird that you haven't fed the cat in the last month. Maybe you should consider <laughs> caring for your animals adequately, that kind of thing. And so I think the last demo I wanted to do was I wanted to show you MythWeb, which is the web interface. Now, back when I used a TiVo, there was no real equivalent to this. Now, it's entirely possible there is now, though. So we'll just start up a browser. I don't care about my old session. So MythWeb lets you do basically anything you can do with a front end. in a web browser. So for instance, uh, these are the recordings that I have on the machine at the moment. Now again, this is the latest release, so it has some stuff you won't see if you just download this, the standard release at the moment. One of the things that I think is insanely cool, uh, where's it put it? It's not what I want. Oh, there we go. Sorry, it was just slow to load, and I'm impatient. Where have you gone? Oh, here we go. So, the latest, the next release of Myth TV, so the latest development versions, have what I'm going to call a YouTube like Flash Player. So, this can stream video from your house to your desk at work, and people will still think you're working. <laughs> and this is actually really interesting. What it's doing is it's transcoding the video on the fly to the right format for the Flash player. It won't do any of the stuff like uh, commercial skipping, but uh, if you're you know, stuck in an airport or something, it's, or in a hotel, it's probably good enough. So, as I said before, MythWeb is a, uh, a web interface that lets you do anything that you can do in a front end. So it seems to me that... Um, reasonably frequently, actually this won't work because there's no guide data on this machine, reasonably frequently though I'll be sitting you know, at lunch and someone will say, hey, did you see blah, and I'll never have heard of that show because I live under a rock or something, and I'll say, no, but it sounds great, so I'll just sit there on my cell phone and start you know, recording it automagically for the you know, next time I get home, so never again will I be left out of lunchtime conversations about the amazing amount of TV I record but never watch. And you know you can rec you can set up recordings, you can play recordings, you can delete recordings, you can do all of that kind of stuff in the web interface. Now, one of the catches with MythWeb is that it doesn't have particularly excellent security. It just uses HT access, so your username and password are sent in the clear. So that might be something to consider when you set it up. But it's just a PHP application; you can get it running in about five minutes. So I've already done that. Now there's some other things I wanted to mention. Now, it seems to me that long term people are going to probably stop getting TV from traditional sources. Like, you've got this Comcast thing or whatever at the moment that, you know, it's very old fashioned, right? Some dude digs a hole and drags a cable to your house and you plug it into this thing on your back of your machine. It's very limiting. Um, there's a couple of ways you can integrate things like YouTube and Google Video and other video sites into Myth. Uh, one of them I wrote, so clearly I think it's cool. It's called MythNet TV. It lets you take RSS and Atom feeds, it downloads them, and then it inserts them as recordings instead of videos. So you get the full recording user interface. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned before that some of my test videos, or almost all of my test videos, are downloaded. So. The ABC, ABC 730 report is a news program from Australia that I miss. So I now just download that. Oh, I missed. Uh, you know, Dignation is another online show that I download. Elephant's Dream is interesting because it's an open source uh, video made with open source packages um, that you can just download for free. But so MythNet TV is just this tool that lets you import videos into Myth so they look like normal recordings. Uh, 
So it doesn't support BitTorrent at the moment, it uses HTTP. The problem with BitTorrent is I'm not really sure when you should end a recording, right? The BitTorrent clients like hanging around and seeding other downloads. So if you did that, then you'd end up with all these BitTorrent clients seeding other people all the time. Uh, which is probably, you know, socially responsible, but it's going to eat all your bandwidth forever. It's hard to detect when a, when a download is finished. But I might be wrong on that. I haven't really played with BitTorrent all that much. The other problem with BitTorrent is discovery, right? I'm not aware of any kind of, you know, RSS feed of things you might want from BitTorrent. So you need some way of discovering the downloads before you start downloading them automatically. So I showed you a, a video that was downloaded that way, but I thought I'd also show you... Now, it at the moment is just a command line tool. So this is a list of the subscriptions I have on this machine. It's just in the form of a text description, which is a show title that appears in the user interface, and a URL to an RSS or Atom feed. And then... You know, you can say stuff like, hey, go download me another show. This one happens to be coming from our Google's public uh, Tech Talk series. And it will download this. It will then transcode it to the right format if it needs to. Then it will put it in the right place and build a skeek table. And it will also detect commercials on these recordings. So if some of them have ads, it can be skipped too. Yeah? Um, so are you going to talk about the, the way it integrates with hardware? Because I'm, I'm curious about remotes and control of an external <coughs> cable box. And Okay. Um, the question is, am I going to talk about, you know, the hardware side and the integration and that kind of thing? I wasn't explicitly. Uh, this talk was originally a three-hour tutorial at a conference, kind of been pared down to an hour, um, of which we've been through about 40 minutes. But I'll talk briefly at the end if you want. Just remind me if I forget. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, speaking about down downloading the videos, it would be nice to integrate it with Myra and use Myra to search for videos. You know, Democracy TV. Okay, yeah, I, so the, the, I guess it's more of a statement than a question. It would be nice to use Miro. I've never seen it, so maybe if you show it to me afterwards or something. Yeah, okay, cool. Alrighty. <laughs> so now that I've convinced you that Myth TV is cool, you have a couple of installation options. There are packages for most Linux, Linux distributions. There's definitely one for, Dor for Fedora, there's definitely one for Debian, there's definitely one for Ubuntu. Uh, you can compile from source, which is actually a good option, even though it sounds a bit scary. Uh, there's lots of websites and a couple of books that will tell you how to compile from source. The advantage of that is you end up with code that, that's optimized for your CPU and your video card and that kind of stuff, which can be advantageous. Or you can get live CDs now, which are cool too. So, you know, you basically put a CD in the machine and blam, you've got a TiVo. And the, a lot of these CDs will also optionally install onto the hard disk if you want to keep it forever. So some of the new stuff that's coming in the next release, and you know, I think I've already shown some of this already. I haven't gone through the complete change log rec recently because it's like you know an inch thick. But some of the cool stuff that really jumps out is there's now clocks in menus, which I thought was nice, even though it's a little thing. The watch list is cool. Uh, what happens is when you play a recording, Myth decides what time. Well, doesn't decide. It de determines what time of day you played it and whether or not you played it to the end and it starts suggesting recordings you'd like to watch at that time of day again. So if you always come home and you know, unwind with an episode of something, then when you get there, the watch list will say, hey, I've noticed you really like watching this thing at this time of day. So how about we watch some of that? And then maybe the kids watch something different at lunchtime, and it will just magically know that, which is kind of cool. Storage directories are interesting. In the current release of Myth TV, videos are always stored in one location. That's not always true in the next release. You can configure different directories for different recordings and stuff like that. So you could, for instance, say, I really, really care about these shows, put them on the RAID array. I don't care so much about these ones, put them on the USB disk that's a little bit flaky. Or you can set up rules and say, hey, you know, you can put videos on you know, the petition that has my home directories, but only so much. I don't want you to fill it um, and put everything else over here. And it's reasonably smart. It can do stuff like move stuff, move videos between directories to balance out load, that kind of thing. Which is kind of cool, because at the moment, if you want to store videos in more than one place, you have to move them and simlink them or poke around in the database to tell it that they're in a different spot, that kind of thing. There's the Flash Player and Mythweb, which I've shown you. And there's uh, universal plug and play support, which means a lot of 
these little devices and you can buy things that look a bit like a VCR except they have no holes on them. There are all these devices that talk on the network and just ask the network nicely if there are any sources of content out there like audio or video. And Myth TV can now do that kind of stuff as well. So a lot of these devices you can just buy, you plug it into your TV and it says, oh, I've noticed there's video over there. Would you like to watch some of that? And there's a bunch more. Like I said, the changelog is about an inch thick these days. Now, I really should talk about guide data a bit. And this is complicated, so I'm going to sit down. So this only really applies to the US, Canada, and Venezuela, I think it is. Um, uh, the guide data for Myth TV and a bunch of open source stuff was provided for quite a while for free by a company called Zap to it, who had you know, their lab site where you could download this guide data for free. Now, Zap to it is owned by a company called Tribune Media Services. Which it turns out there's basically two sources of guide data in the US, Tribune and another company I can't remember the name of. Now, those companies' value add is they take all these data feeds from all the different TV affiliates and stuff, and they unhorrible them. So they do stuff like they put in descriptions of the shows, they make the spelling consistent, that kind of stuff. And then, basically, everybody else buys the data off them because they've got lots of humans doing this particularly horrible job. Um, and they recently announced, it was probably a couple of months ago now, that they're going to stop providing this guide data for free. They felt there was some abuse occurring and they're just going to turn off the site. And I think it's the 1st of September. Big panic. Thousands of emails on a mailing list. Blah, 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 blah. Eventually it comes down to the guys who wrote Myth and uh, people associated with a bunch of other open source projects like XML TV have gotten together and started a company called Schedules Direct. And this company is going to provide this guide data instead. They've actually signed a license agreement with Tribune Media Services. Um, the catch, of course, is they're going to have costs in hosting it, so it's no longer going to be free. It's going to be almost free. I think they're talking at the moment about, for the first quarter, I think they want $20 for three months, and then they'll change the pricing based on how many people actually sign up. And they, they're saying they're going to try and iterate down to it being as close to free as they can get while still paying their costs. It's just they don't know how many people are actually going to use it and how much it's actually going to cost and that kind of stuff. So there is a guide data solution. But we're in this transition phase. They haven't started providing guide data yet, and zap to it is going to stop providing it soon. So there's still a little bit of panic on the mailing lists. But I think, you know, long term, there'll be a real solution to this. I was talking to a, a guy a couple of hours ago, and my advice to him is probably don't build a box this week. I would wait a couple of weeks and see how things sort themselves out and then decide what to do. Yeah, so the question is, why did Zap do it, do it for free? The short answer is not very short, to be honest. Um, the way guide data happens in a lot of other countries is a technique called screen scraping. You get a web client, you hit a web page, like, you know, for instance, Yahoo, who has a TV guide site, it's quite nice, and you parse the HTML and decide what shows are on when. And then, you know, that probably doesn't have the description, so then you click on every link for every show to get the description. And, you know, thousands of hits later, you have the guide data. The, the attitude that most companies have taken to that is they yell at you and threaten to sue you if you don't stop, because it turns out they're using lots of bandwidth, it's not very nice to their machines, etc. Zap to it said, hey, why don't we just give you the data in a form that doesn't suck? And off they went. Now, ultimately, you know, that didn't work out because, you know, one of the complaints they had was that people were selling machines with Myth TV installed that all used one account. And the accounts have attributes like, hey, please get your guide data at this time of day so they can even out the load. But that didn't work if there were a thousand machines all using the same username and password. So, uh, you know, I, th I think we're going to iterate to a solution that's reasonably good. It might just take a little time. The other thing is if schedules direct doesn't work out, there's no reason that we can't go back to screen scraping. It's just someone would have to write the code, and whoever gets screen scraped is probably not going to be very happy about it. You should mention the Zap to it. Yeah, so that, that's true. So Zap to its business model is they provide this data to other people for lots of money. Now, they gave it out to the community for free, and for whatever reason, and I guess it's their right to, they've decided not to. So there has been you know, some accusation on the Myth TV mailing list that there's a hidden agenda here and you know, whatever. But you know, ultimately, it's their data. They can withhold it if they want to, I suppose. Yeah? So uh, what about high-def channels and information? You know, schedule information? 
So they're just treated like normal TV channels with the zap to it data. I assume that will be true of the schedules direct data as well. One of the things the schedules direct guys have said is because they've signed a contract and they're giving TMS money, they also get a little bit more control. So they have a contractual ability to say, hey, we need the data format changed because we're giving you lots of money. And you know, they stand a lot more chance of getting it changed than just random people who are getting it for free. So I, I think the takeaway is, despite all the panic, there will be guide data. We're pretty sure it will come from Schedules Direct. You know, hey, I think some patience is required, and that's about it. So I'll get up again. Ah, so that's the end of my slides. Now, you asked about hardware, right? But have you got a quick question first? Um, but if you don't have scheduled data, you can schedule recordings according to time and channel? Is that yes. Okay. So, so the question was about manual scheduling. It's a lot like a TiVo. If you don't have TiVo guide data, then you can say, hey, record at this time on this channel for this length. Okay. You can do that with Myth as well. You won't get any of the guide data information. So the system won't know what the show is named or anything like that. But absolute worst case, if you really, really cared about a show, you could start reading Dead Tree or something and setting up manual recordings. Uh, yeah. So the, que the other question was about hardware. Now, one of the reasons I didn't want to talk about hardware is it's different for everybody. Every video card is different. Uh, every remote control system is different. And some of them are fiddly, and some of them are just great. So for instance, I had a lot of trouble getting LIRC, which is the standard way of doing remote control working. But then I bought a fancy media center case, like one of these home theater PC cases that had an inbuilt infrared remote, and that just worked. So it kind of depends on your experience. Your best bet is to look at the Myth site and see what hardware is recommended. I won't recite the list because it's long. Most people, in, in the US at least, end up with a Horpage capture card, and they just work mostly. Um, you need to buy one that's not branded as a media center. Like, you know, Windows, the ones branded Windows Media Center don't work as well as the ones that aren't uh, just branded, you know, WinPVR. Um, you, you know, they have an inbuilt remote that works well with LIRC. Your video card choice can matter a little bit because some video cards are louder than others, for instance, and some do, you know, uh, video playback better than others. So, uh, you know, for instance, I originally had a GeForce card that didn't work very well, and then I changed to a different NVIDIA card, and that one worked well. I, I guess I was more interested in things like if uh, most content nowadays seems to come on uh, on transport mechanisms that requires an external decoder, uh, you know, like a, a direct TV thing with a smart card in it, or mm -hmm. a Comcast cable box, how does the software command external decoder mm -hmm. to change channel, um, mm -hmm. does it have an IR transmitter or something? The short answer is yes. But to rephrase the question, um, because I get to do that because I'm the speaker, I suppose, there's two, really two questions there. There's what about devices, you know, channels that require external decoders, like for instance, you know, Dish TV or high def channels, that kind of thing. And what about IR blasting? So uh, external encoder. Uh, External receivers like that are supported. Often you'll just plug them in with an S-video cable or whatever. Uh, the, and the, pr the problem is mostly that control of the external unit. LIRC supports IR blasting, which is you know, kind of the approach that we used with TiVos in Australia. Um, IR blasting is not 100% reliable. If you're reasonably assertive with your TV provider, you can insist on a certain model of set-top boxes. And some of them have firewire or serial interfaces, which are much more reliable to control. And they're supported as well. In fact, some of the high def uh, set-top boxes will just provide you the video on firewire, if you ask nicely. But that depends on your local provider and what set-top box they're using and that kind of thing. Ultimately, I think it comes down to, again, looking through the list of what your options are in your area and making a reasonable decision. There must be one of the reasonably few people still on analog cable here because it just works with my Horpage card. You know, occasionally Comcast will ring me up and say, you know, for $2 a month we'll give you free channels and, and a high def box. And I say, well, until you have a cable card that works in, with Linux, I'm not interested. <laughs> but you know, Windows Media Center has the same problem. They've only just released um, uh, tuner cards that can do high def with the smart card encryption-y stuff. And not all vendors work all that reliably. It's still kind of iterating down to a sensible solution. 
And once that's happened, you might see better support in Linux as well. So that, like I said, that's all the slides I have. Are there any other questions? Yeah. So I'm very traditional, which is why I picked ext3. It's just what I've used for everything. Um, any extents-based file system should be fine as long as it's reliable. So I, I'm not really keeping track of where JFS is up to or anything like that. But um, yeah, it should be fine. It's just a Linux file system, right? As long as you trust it with data, you should be OK. OK. So, so what about uh, remote file systems? Uh, they just work, is the short answer. If you can mount it in Linux, it will work. Bandwidth can be an issue, but then realistically, encoded video is not that much data per minute. Uh, like I think you know, my recordings are generally in the order of two gigabytes an hour. That's not that much data. Um, when we were writing the book, we started worrying a lot about you know, how many tuner cards could you add before you saturated the disk, or how many front ends could you use before you know, started worrying about network bandwidth and stuff. And so we did some tests, and the reality is you're going to have to try pretty hard, I think. Like if you had a slow wireless network, you're going to have a bad day. But if you're using like a wired network and you've got you know, SATA or IDE disks or something like that, you know, something that's not you know, 15 years old, you should be fine. Yeah? So if you've got something like, if, if you wanted multiple capture cards, and say you've got one that, um, if, if I understand the way the Comcast works around here, you can get a lot of the channels um, just with a normal tuner, but there are a whole bunch of other channels that you actually need their decoder for. Mm -hmm. does, it, does it have abstractions for, okay, I've got two tuners, but this tuner can only get channels one through 50, and if you want the other channels, you have to use this tuner, and so prioritize the tuners according to what channel? The really short answer is yes. <laughs> um, the, the question is, hey, you know, so some channels might only be available on one tuner, it's also possible, I suppose, that one tune is nicer than another, that kind of thing. Can you configure all of that? The long answer is yes. You can set up preferences. You can say, always record this show on this tuner. Um, always use this tuner if it's free. This tuner gets this list of channels, and this tuner gets this different list of channels. For instance, I've got two tuners, and one's an old card I picked up cheap off someone I met at work. So I prefer to not use that tuner. So yeah, you can, you can define all these preferences around that kind of stuff. Yeah. So what's the like, cheapest, lowest G4 series that offers full acceleration for identity? Okay, so the question is a really specific question about video cards that I can't answer off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up, to be honest. Just, just as a data point. I don't know, have any idea what you just said, Leslie. That's okay. I'll tell you later. Okay. So, so if, if, you, uh, if you play back HD or record it, like a full HD stream is like 2 megabytes a second. So if you have a NAS box, which is like 20, yeah, so the comment was that a full HD screen was, what, two mega second, you said? Yeah, like I said, I don't get any HD because I'm pig-headed. Um, actually, an analog cable, you can get HD. You probably know that. Yeah, so Comcast offered me a free you know, HD thingy I plug in, and it's horrible. It's really, really horrible. Yeah, no, it's a basic cable. You just have to have an ATSC tuner. Oh, OK. It's there anywhere. Yeah, yeah. OK, they, cool. They don't advertise it, but it's government, you know, they're yeah, mandated, so they have to have it. It's, it's just they don't advertise because they want to sell you something else. Yeah, so the, the other thing is Comcast rang me up at one point and offered me for literally zero dollars a month, but there was a price on it, it was just zero. This little external box that I'm pretty sure is doing video over IP, um, and it's using the, you know, the data back channel that's on the, the analog cable to download video, but it's horrible. Like it's, you know, all those MPEG compression artifacts where it goes blocky and stuff, it's like that the whole time. So I used it for about a week and then I turned it off, so. Okay, cool. So, but, you know, the, um, you know, HD piece, you know, like, you know, there's like this one Linux supported card. You can plug in your PC and you know, have two recording basically, you know, inputs like the regular analog and the HD channels. Okay, cool. And, and they have also a version where you basically have, you have two HD tuners and, a, and an Ethernet interface. So you can just, you know, basically, you know, whoever can connect to the network can, you know, record. It's called, yeah, exactly, the HD home run. Oh, the HD home run's cool. Sorry. So the gentleman's mentioning the HD home run. It's also interesting because it's a tuner that doesn't have to plug into the PC. So you can get these devices that you plug into your you know, cable thing or antenna or whatever you've got, 
and you plug it into the network and you stick it under a couch. And then the myth box goes and gets the video over the network. So that's another way of solving the, you know, my cable provider put the you know, socket in this horrible place, I don't want to put a computer, that kind of thing. I think we should call it a night. If you've got any other questions, feel free to come up and have a chat. Um, and uh, Leslie wants you to come up and read the back of my t-shirt, I think. I think I'm pretty sure that's what that said. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you the oh, okay. Yeah, so this is the t-shirt that Leslie gave me. It's lovely. It's actually just a cool shirt. <laughs> uh, because it says, may the source be with you and you and you, and therefore it's very clever. Oh, Plus, sick. Michael has written a book which you should look at. Actually, I've written a couple, but that's okay. I've also, because I didn't want to shield the book, I know I mentioned it a couple of times, but that was just my excuse for learning about myth. I also have the competing book. So, whatever. All right, you guys have a good night.